Um, so last time we cover uh, chapter seven. Yep. And then uh, we're going to discuss the first exercise, right? Let yeah. Me... Mm, yeah, yeah, we can uh, basically. Uh, I, I was thinking if why don't we do it um, together? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, let me just uh, read what is the the purpose of the exercise. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so in this exercise. Um, we're going to use some of the techniques that they were uh, discussed in this chapter in terms of using the the linear regression model applied to time series, the TSLM. And in this case, what we're going to do is that we're going to use this uh, data set, which is the electricity demand for Victoria, Australia, uh, measure uh, half an hour, okay? so. Is going to be measured at the hour and then 30 minutes after and so on. Uh, so one of the things that we need to be aware because we're in the Northern Hemisphere is that the seasons in Australia are opposite to our seasons. For example, in January, which is going to be the, the filtering that we're going to be uh, doing, uh, that filter in January is going to be a cold month in Australia. So it's going to be winter in Australia. Uh, uh, excuse me, summer. <laughs> I always get confused. It's going to be summer in Australia. December, January, and February are summer, summer months in Australia. Opposite to our winter months, which are in the same, in the same period. So we have to be aware of that because uh, the temperature is going to be affecting the electricity demand because of the heating, uh, uh, you know, the heating a uh, uh, need uh, for household, commercials, and etc. So this is the 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 author already gave us the uh, the code, you know, to subset this. Uh, 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 data set just for the January uh, period, okay? So if you want, I can show you my screen, the RStudio screen, okay? And I basically what it did was copy, right? Uh, that, that part of the snippet to get the January um, uh, values of electricity and temperature, electricity demand and temperature. And also the author tell us that we're going to aggregate, right? You know, we're going to aggregate the, the, the date, the day component, we're going to aggregate by daily. Remember, it's half an hour, right? So in each day, we are going to have 48 observations. So those four observations are going to be aggregated into that day. And we're going to then aggregate the daily demand by totaling, you know, adding all those 48 observations within the day, adding it up. And then for the temperature, we're going to add, we're going to look for that, that period daily of 40 observations. We're going to extract the maximum. Uh, temperature for that particular day, okay? And that's what this, you know, code is really doing, <clears throat> okay? So any any any, uh, any observations or comments there? Yeah, that's, uh, we, we do this with this index by uh, function. Right. right, because we're, we're using the symbol, right? Yeah. The Sybil uh, uh, data set type. So we're going to be using an index, okay, which usually is the date, right, or the date and time. But in this case, the day will suffice because we're going to add it, but you know, aggregate everything by day. So we we only need that day component. 
and it's going to be indexed because the Sybil needs an index for that day component. Okay. Yeah, and uh, this this function index by is is quite interesting because it's um, mm -hmm. similar to summarize so to group by, uh, and then you add the summarize function. Right. Yeah. Then when you index because you are in the index, what you're doing is that yeah, you are doing kind of a group by. If if we if we're doing it in a in a in an ordinary data set, you know, a table data set, we will use a group by. By, by date, right? Okay, extract that date component, group by by date, and then summarize. It's basically the same, the, the same thing. In fact, <laughs> it's interesting that this index, uh, you know, uh, uh, way of doing things is more akin to Python than R. <laughs> okay, in 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 Python, you in you know you you take the data as an index. Okay, so it's kind of outside. The, the 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 data frame format okay because python uses uses index, indexes so that that's you know so, something that kind of you know pop in my head okay so uh running this okay and already run it uh we're going to you know subset it with another data set called vic elec uh january 14 and basically, this is this is the the result. Okay, if you can see on my left uh, down corner, you see the date, which is the index, right? You see the demand aggregated by day, right? Those forty observations are going to aggregate it by day during January, and then in the temperature, we're going to have the maximum temperature each of each forty eight observations of each particular day, and that's what we're working with. Okay. So the next, uh, okay, now that we have our data set, now we're going to do, you know, we're going to start doing the, you know, the answers for the questions. So the first question is to plot that data, okay? And using the regression model for demand as temperature as an explanatory uh, variable. In other words, demand explained by temperature, okay, with the, with a weekly weekly sign, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, try to answer why there's a positive relationship. Okay, so I I before doing that, right? Uh, it says plot, right? Plot the the data. So I'm going to use the auto plot, right? Uh, function, which is a wrapper for ggplot in you know, in, in the in the package. But then I'm going to add a smoother. And why I'm doing that, I want to see if there's a trend. And if there's a trend, is there some up all the way, down all the way, or ups and downs? That's what the low, uh, lush or low S is going to give me. It's going to give me kind of a smooth uh, curve, okay? So if I do that with the auto plot, you know, plotting the, the the time series by itself, and then doing the smoothing, and we get this. Okay. So as you can see, there is a upward trend, right, in the electricity demand. There is a peak, uh, you know, kind of January fifteen, January sixteen, and then it goes down. Okay, and then plateaus. In this, you know, in this uh, January, maybe 24, 25, and then goes up. Okay. So we see that, you know, the pattern is kind of, uh, you know, up and down, right? It's not a smooth trend up or a smooth trend down. It's kind of, you know, up and down, uh, depending on several factors, which probably the temperature will be one of them. So doing the time series uh, model, okay, with the TSLM uh, function, right? Uh, we're going to fit the demand explained by the temperature as, as the author is, is, is telling us, okay? So remember that the LM function in R, uh, when you do a fitting with the LM, you want to extract the information of that fitted model by summary. 
in the case of this package, he's using a function that is similar, but it's report. Okay, so instead of summary, we're going to use now report to get the coefficients, get the adjusted R square, et cetera. So I already fitted the model, okay, for you know time's sake. And then we get this you know, report, right? This report, the series, the, the variable that we are, you know, the response is demand. We get the residuals, you know, the main, the medium, the maximum, which is kind of, a, you know, the five point, the summary for the residuals. And then we get the coefficients. And the question is, why the coefficient on temperature, uh, what, what do you think, what do you think is positive? Okay, let me go back to the thing, Bella. Okay, why is there a positive relationship between temperature and demand? And as you can see, the, the answer is kind of obvious, right? Uh, the temperature is going to be affecting directly the electricity demand in this model, okay? There could be other factors, but the temperature is going to be uh, affecting positively the electricity, in other words. If the demand go, uh, the temperature goes up, the demand will go will go up too. Okay, that's what that model is telling us. In reality, we know that, for example, when the temperature goes up, the demand goes goes up, but also when the temperature goes down, also the demand will go up too. Okay, it depends on which season are we. We are in the in the summer season, right? So it's is uh, in in the in the summer season usually when the temperature goes up, the electricity demand also goes up too. Okay, if we are talking about the winter season, it's going to be reverse. When the temperatures go down, then the demand also is going to be up. Okay, because of the cooling and the heating, uh, you know, uh, demand. All right. So because we're in January, we can explain that. But if we are in July, probably we'll see a different sign in that coefficient probably will be negative or at least we expect to be negative all right so far so good Federica? good okay so uh we we see also apart from the positive relationship that those three stars uh besides the the temperature it means that the coefficient, the coefficient is highly significant in terms of statistical significance. So that means that that coefficient, the probability of being zero is very low, okay? And the adjusted R square for this model is 0. 0.757, which, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a good uh, a number. Tell us that, that percentage, 70, 77, 78 percent, the model is explaining 78 percent of the variance of the response, which is uh, demand. Okay. All right. So we got, we, we answered that one. Then the author asked us to plot a residual, the residual plot. And in that case, what we're going to use is this function. Uh, GG underscore TS residuals, which again, is also a wrapper for three plots that we're going to see. So let's, let's uh, run it to illustrate what, which are the, th the, those three plots. Okay. So uh, the plot at the top, right? At the top of the of the window, the top is going to be the sequence, right? The sequence of, of residuals, but this one are innovation residuals. So they're adjusted a residual. They're not the original residuals that we see in a linear regression model. These are the innovation residuals. And we discussed this in chapter five, okay? We just, they have an adjustment because of the lags, okay? Uh, okay, so question. Uh, for the audience, in this case, Federica. Uh, do you see a trend here, Federica, in the residuals? 
um, well, in some senses, yes, this this mm -hmm. uh, central uh, part is quite uh, um, the, the basically uh, from the middle uh, um, January. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite. Like okay, linear. so. Yeah. I also concur that there could there could be a trend here, and that's not that's not what we what we want for the assumption of the model because these residuals they need to be uh, random, okay. In other words, they shouldn't have any pattern, okay, like the residuals in the linear linear model. So to try to gather more information about those residuals, what I did was with this script right here what i did was with the augment uh function from the broom package that the author also also uses uh i extracted the, those innovation residuals in other words i want to extract those points okay in that sequence and then what i'm going to do is that i'm going to plot them okay to see if there is a trend with a smoother Okay, the the same basically the same thing that we did with the plot, but now the smoother is going to be a linear trend. So if the residuals they don't have a pattern, that means that there's going to be a line very near zero that is going to be flat. Okay, so that's what uh, we we expect from uh, a model that is uh, you know that is in concordance with the assumptions. So let, let's see what happens. Okay, we have the innovation residuals, and then we're going to plot those residuals. Okay, so this is the same plot that we have on top, but now we have a smoother. Okay, and that smoother is a linear, it's a linear model. It's not the lows. Okay, it's a linear model. And as you can see very clearly, that's a trend. Okay. The trend of the residuals is that they are going up. <laughs> All right. So that means that the the assumption that those residuals are, you know, are random or they are independent of each other uh, is not is not valid. Okay, for this particular model. Also, you can do a, what is called a Shapiro will test. Okay, to test the normality, right, of uh, of the residuals. So that's why, because we have already the residuals here, so right? You know, I, we extract it with the with the augment function. I can do that to also get another verification if those residuals have a pattern or they are they, they are you know behaving random. So if I run this, I see that the the, the p value of that uh, test. Is 0 0.0697. Let's round it to 0 0.07. So if we are using a 0 0.05 threshold, you know, to reject or accept our null hypothesis, the whole hypothesis is that the residuals are random. That means, right? That means that those residuals should have, you know, should be should be behaving randomly as you have a normal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a, a normal uh, distribution. Okay, but judging from this plot, uh, I will I will say that you know I will agree more on the plot of what I'm seeing than on the test. Okay, so even though the test is saying that they are normally distributed, I don't think they're random. Okay, in other words, you know we have to tweak that model to make sure that we get more random, you know, more of a flat line of that plot of the receipt. Okay. So these are some of the things that you have to, you know, you have to investigate, you have to research on your model to see if your model is conforming with the assumptions of, uh, of a linear regression model, okay? Any comments so far? Are good? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's all good, all good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then there's another uh, test, it's called the Young Box Test which it incorporates the lags, okay? So it's very useful for time series because in time series, the only assumption that we 
it, that, that is different from an ordinary linear regression is that the observations should autocorrelate. Okay, so there should be an autocorrelation between the observations, not the residuals, the observations. Okay, so one of the things that we want to do also with the Elgin box text is uh, to verify if the residuals, okay, if they have a lag. In other words, if the if 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 there's a lag, that means that there is a pattern that the model is not capturing in the residuals. Okay, so if we go back to our three uh, plot panel from the GG uh, underscore TS residuals, we see that in this second plot, which are the lags for the residuals, we see that all of them fall between those dash you know lines so that means that they should there shouldn't be any significant lag and that l jump box test is going to confirm what we're seeing visually okay if some of the lags cross that you know dotted line that means that that lag is significant and the model is not capturing it's not capturing it so we you know we have to tweak that model maybe add a lag or do something to then capture that information, all right? So when we uh, run the L -L jump for the, for the residuals, we're going to get something like this, okay? With lag 14, which is the last one here, okay? I'm, I'm using the last uh, lag of the, of the plot. And what we're seeing is that the p-value here is 0.624. That means that the null hypothesis that there are no significant lags in the residuals is, is, is valid. Okay, we, we don't have any information from the p-value to reject the hypothesis. Okay. We're going to see more of this test in the RIMA, in the RIMA model, because that's one of the parameters that we want to. We want to make sure that the model captures most of the information, okay, in terms of lags, and the residuals basically are within those lags of the residuals are between those uh, dotted lines. Okay. All right. So the third question is related to the forecast. So we're going to forecast, we're in January, right? The January. Uh, uh, period. So we're going to forecast the next uh, point from January, which is February 1st, 2014. Okay. And because our uh, dependent, uh, you know, the, our predictor is temperature, what the author says is try a maximum temperature of 15 degrees Celsius first, and then try another forecast with 35 degrees Celsius, okay? Usually because we're in the winter uh, period, 15 uh, degrees Celsius, it should be kind of in the low, right? In the low uh, range of prediction. 35 will be very high, especially, you know, in the, in, excuse me, in the summer. It's going to be 15 low range and 35 high range, okay? So let's see how we do this. And the author helped us with this with this script, okay? Uh, using the model to forecast with new data, forecast the temperature of 15 or 35, and then, and then I plot it. So we're going to run that, okay, the forecast, and then we're going to plot it, right? And basically this is the forecast, okay? If we want to get the numbers from that from that plot, this is the script, which is, you know, it will be the same model of forecasting, but then the information is in demand, uh, the first, you know, the, the first uh, item of that demand, which is a list, okay? Let me see here, okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, so that number, that forecast is going to be uh, 151,398, 
okay? And there's going to be a, a prediction interval between 80% or 95%. And one of the things that, you know, it gave me a little bit of hard time to try to find out which was the function or where in the forecast was that information, right? Because here it's just giving me one, you know, one uh, uh, interval, okay? Uh, one interval, I, I believe it's not the, the 95%. But the 80%, uh, I didn't know exactly where to, you know, where to get it. Well, I kept, you know, looking and looking and looking until I found this, uh, uh, this, uh, this article from, from the author, okay? Let me move this, okay? Study forecasting in R, which is from, from his blog. I'm going to put it here, okay, in the, in the chat. Okay, and in that in that article, you know, to give you the to give you the highlight here, in that article he mentions a function that is not, you know, at least I didn't find it anywhere in the in 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 the package. It's, it's a fable package. So this function high low, okay, when you enter the feed and model for the forecast and it, and, it, and you give them the level is going to give you the forecast and also the range the range between let's say 95 percent uh, prediction interval or 80 percent prediction interval okay because the, the author asked for it in the in the exercise right okay give prediction inter intervals for your forecast in other words not only visually, but also tell us, you know, which are which are the numbers. At least that that's my interpretation. So we got the forecast, and we got you know this kind of dark, you know, purple line, which is eighty percent <coughs> prediction interval, and then the one that goes a little bit beyond, which is the ninety-five. So with the high-low uh, function, we know exactly which numbers are we dealing with. Okay, so let's run it. And the forecast is not going to change, but then this, these are the numbers, okay? <coughs> Sorry. Let me run it again because, you know, it kind of, you know, truncated there. Okay, these are the numbers for the prediction interval at 80%. It's going to be 117,009, et cetera. And the other is going to be 184, 888. Okay. So between those ranges at 85% prediction interval, our forecast is going to be moving. Okay. You know, through each of the new of the new uh, observations. In this case, it's only one. If we had a week, for example, a week, then you will see kind of you know, you know, seven, seven uh different points, seven different forecasts, and seven different. Uh, prediction intervals. Then if we go to 95% with the same function, high, low, then of course, the range is going to be expanded. Okay, so right now in 95% pressure interval, the range is going to be from 100,000 to 202,000. Okay, and what was the What was the, um, you know, the actual value, right? The actual value of that, uh, of, of, of that observation. Let me see if I, if I have it here. Okay, yeah, here. Okay, I want to compare it to the actual demand for February 1st, 2014, because we know that number, okay? You know, it's already, you know, recorded there. It's, 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 it's historic. The only thing that we are trying to see if our model can predict accurately, you know, that, that number. So this is the number. Okay. For February 1st, uh, 2014, the actual demand was 2,041,023. 
and the temperature was 28.2, okay? So that means that our forecast underestimated the actual demand that happened in that day because our higher upper limit on the prediction interval for 95% was 202,000, 617. That was our highest. And the actual demand was 241,023. So that means that our model is underestimating the actual uh, demand, even though the temperature is within range, is within 15 and 35, okay? So we have to see you know, what kind of tweaks we can do with our models, maybe add some lags, maybe add some splines, et cetera, to try to see if we can improve uh, the forecast for the next, you know, the, the next months. Okay. All right. So let's see if we cover everything. Okay. Plot. Okay. It says plot demand versus temperature for all the variable for the data available for big, big uh, electric. Okay. Aggregated by total demand daily and maximum temperature. And what are your thoughts? So this is the graph that I did taking the whole data set, not just January, whole data set, okay? I summarize it, I index it, summarize it. I did the a mutate, a, a mutate to scale it, to have the same scale for each of the, each of the time series because temperature is in the, is in the hundreds and <laughs> demand is in the thousands, okay? So to see at, at the same level of, uh, of scaling, you have to scale both. Okay, and then do a pivot longer, do it on a plot, and do some, you know, uh, uh, axis labeling. Uh, we get this. Okay. So as we expected, when the the demand usually, see, is peaking in two periods during the year. Is peaking in the summer period, which is from December to February, and then in the winter uh, months, which is June, July, August. Okay, so we have two different peaks, but the temperature has only one peak. Okay, which is in the months of summer. So one of the things that you know the challenge here is that. There's going to be some seasonality that is going to be affecting our, our forecast, okay? And of course, the lags, okay? We have to see, you know, what kind of lags are useful to input to the model and then, you know, get a, a, better, a better forecast. But that's going to be, you know, uh, we're going to deal with that later, okay? So that's basically exercise one. <laughs> Yeah, I like I, I like it because it's a very complete exercise and you know apart from the high low function that it gave me a little bit of headache you know try to find it uh, because it's not in the references okay uh, the rest is kind of you know is 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 explained in the the chapter so it's kind of a good summary you know to practice and to you know tinker with yeah okay so that's it. <laughs> okay so ready to start chapter eight <laughs> yeah yeah okay yeah, not, not today not today okay not, not today no. okay so we have uh 235 um if we have some if you have something else that you want to discuss yeah you know, from, from this uh, yeah, chapter yeah. or any chapter yeah, no, no, no. That is about this chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, I was uh, um playing with it around a bit, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to. Um, let's go back. Um, to the to the beginning of, of the chapter. Okay, so what I found very interesting. Uh, where the definitions uh, for the 
uh, model function and um, so the the, the 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 regression model functions and the explanations very clear uh, and clearly explained so let, let's say that um, let, let's jump back uh, a minute so for example if I want to uh visualize a linear uh relationship between two variables and uh let's say that one behave the the so my my outcome behaves normally uh while the other one is just a sequence uh, uh of numbers okay so um i can simulate uh, the, the my table with this uh, uh, synthetic data, uh, mm -hmm. and then find uh, um, something which is very similar to one of the data sets in the book. Okay, so where you can uh, visualize a, a positive linear relationship between these two variables. Uh, if we uh, then jump into the data found in the in uh, in the book, okay, and here is very, the very beginning of the job that they mentioned this uh, U.S. change data set, okay. So mm -hmm. here we have uh, uh, the the what what we want to uh, basically analyze is the behavior of the consumption explained by the income. Um, so, and here you can see that uh, within time, uh, they are, uh, they have quite similar uh, trend. We already discussed about that. Uh, but what the, my, my uh, so uh, inside about those things, if I do the mean, Okay, of the observed value about consumption, I have a certain like um, value. Uh, if, as I, I see that there is, there is quite uh, a linear relationship, okay, if you can imagine here a smooth uh, that will cross uh, uh, the lines uh, from side to side, okay. So uh, let, let's use a simple uh, a linear regression. So a linear model using consumption explained by income and then fit. So, and this way we fit the model. And then we, I, I like to, to stop a bit what fitting a model means. So the, the result is this. So the, um, this is the intercept and this is the income so the intercept is basically the, the the mean value of the consumption when income is zero okay and you, as you can see uh this is quite you know lower than than what we found uh what if i add the one for for any uh, increase or decrease or any uh, unit change of the uh, of my predictor, I have a um, uh, increase on average, an increase uh, of um, in consumption mm -hmm. of uh, 0.27. If I sum up these two values, imagine the income uh, is it's it's one. So I um, obtain something which is very close to the mean of observed values. Okay, so here what's happened if I uh, do what I did with my synthetic data, the same thing I do with uh, the, the, the US change, and I have the income here, which is the x-axis, and the consumption on the y-axis. So the consumption means that this is the my uh, outcome. So the response variable is explained by the predictor, in this case, the income. So there is, there is a positive relationship. So 
uh, for, for each increase uh, unit in, uh, increase of income is expected uh, consumption to be increasing as well. Um, what this uh, um, uh, time series linear model does uh, compared to the simple linear model, okay, is that, um, as you can see, the, the values are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I have the uh, adjusted square, which is very, very low. So this, this tells you something. So you, you, you should adjust your model differently to reach a, a, an highest value. So because the, the uh, closest to one, of this value, the, the better is the model. Um, we have some information about the residual on the first the first uh, quantile, the mean on the third quantile, and everything. So the coefficients, so all the things that we have uh, inside a linear model, simple linear model. Uh, here, um, can this slide is better? Okay, what I said is that, so this is the function uh, for a simple, uh, for, for a linear regression model. So we have an intercept and one predictor. Uh, while a multiple uh, linear regression model has an intercept and a certain number of predictors. Both of the, the models uh, contain some errors because we cannot expect to, uh, to, to predict or basically to adjust. Um, so within a function, with using a function to be able to replicate exactly uh, the observed value. So we expect that some differences Okay. Mm -hmm. And, so and those errors, uh, Federica, yeah. those errors are the residuals. Exactly. Okay. What, what, that, what, that difference yeah. between the distance between the, the, the model, the line model, and the observation, that difference is the residual. Okay. And for it to be, you know, a valid model, you need the residuals to behave in a certain way. That's why you do the, you know, the, the, the test, you do uh, you know normality tests and all that to see if the assumptions of the model are valid. Exactly. So to to um, visualize what what's happened within um, a multiple uh, linear model, this is something that we are attempting to analyze. So we have the consumption, which is something. This is our response. So. The, our outcome. We want to explain consumption based not only on income, but we want to have a look at what happened within production and employment and saving. See, if I plot uh, all of them, each one against consumption, I can see that they, they behave differently. So mm -hmm. income we already seen is growing, uh, production is growing, and employment is going down. Saving is going down. So if I save more money, obviously I can cons consume less than, than, and so for unemployment. Mm -hmm. When more I build... unemployment, less consumption. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, this is what's happened in, in within a linear model. So I have my um, response variable, and these are all my predictors. So the this summary. Is now a bit like uh, different, so I need to explain, uh, and I, I have a, a little explanation of any changes in unit for income, production, and saving. How they reflect the changes within consumption. Just to summarize a bit, let's have a look at the R square. Completely changed, so has grown. Uh, a lot compared to 0.1, okay, 0.14. Now it's 0.17. So 
So that mm -hmm. means that I have a, bit, a better model within the ends, uh, uh, combining those, values, those other predictors. Even if it's not said that, that is the best way to, that this is the best model. But how can I, um, how can I uh, explain to myself what's happened inside a model? Okay, inside the LM function, something happened. Okay, and uh, what's happened is that I am minimizing, I'm searching for uh, values which are coefficients. So th those betas here that will be able within my with my predictors to uh, release the le the latest so the least uh, mm, squared so the minimum value of the uh, the difference between my observed value and the and, my, and the result of my function so it's not it's not uh, actually, uh, simple to express. It's very, so it, you know, basically, what's happened when I train a model is that my model search for the minimum value, for the minimum value, uh, that will be uh, the betas, all this beta here what my model is going to choose are the minimum values. And to do, in order to do that, what does is does the sum of the differences between the colon of the consumption in this case, okay, the vector, which is my observed vector value uh, or values that I want to predict. And it is my yt. So these are the observed values. And these are my attempts to predict. Okay. So I'm searching for coefficients. So those betas here, which okay. are able to minimize this difference. Yeah. Okay. But that, that, there's a big difference here from your original uh, mul multiple regression uh, a formula. Okay. Is that those t's that you're seeing as subscripts, those t's, yeah. they mean that there's an order to them, okay? In your original multiple linear regression, uh, there's no order. Okay. okay. You know, you take the values, okay, as, you know, as, as uh, not as a sequence of events, but as values that are in, a, in the same space. Okay, mm -hmm. so in other words, in the original multiple regression or linear regression model, uh, you don't have any any component of time there. Yeah. Okay. okay. You just have income, mm -hmm. you know, uh, observations on income and observations on consumption, and they mm -hmm. are all independent. You're not assigning a sequence or anything like that. In mm -hmm. this model, in particular for the time series, the 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 sequence is very important. Right, mm -hmm. because those points are going to be aligned with each with each other. So, mm -hmm. for example, the consumption at time zero, in other words, the first the first observation, is going to be aligned with income at time zero, with production at time zero, with unemployment at time zero, and uh, savings mm -hmm. at time zero. Okay, yeah. they're going to be you know uh, happening in the same you know sequence of events. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that puts our assumption independence goes out of the window. <laughs> okay, because now there is a temporal component that you have to you you, you know you have to add you know to this formula. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah. then you're going to have autocorrelations. You're going to have lags. You're going to have differencing. You're going to have a series of uh, parameters that you don't have in your ordinary uh, mm -hmm. linear. Yeah. That that's the main difference here, okay? Yeah. Because everything else is basically the same, mm -mm. okay? And exactly. it's because of the assumptions of the model. 
all the assumptions of the linear regression model apply to the time series regression model. The only mm -hmm. one that doesn't apply is the autocorrelation mm -hmm. because it's the sequence, okay, yeah. that they have to follow, okay? It's kind of a constraint, really, you know, in, yeah. in, in the model. So, for example, you cannot mix, except you, if you are doing lags, right? But you cannot mix, for example, uh, consumption in T0 with income in T10. You cannot do that unless there's a lag. Okay? You know, okay. everything okay. is going to be in blocks, in, in sequence of, uh, of events. Yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. And that's okay. the main difference here. Mm -hmm. I, I like this, uh, this, this definition. So fitting the model to data or sometimes learning on training the model. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is- That's what's fitting what, is, yeah. This, yeah, this is what means training a model, searching for the lowest difference between the observed value and what I, I am going to, so that coefficient that I'm going to use for future predictions, because it's very close, mm -hmm. replicating my, observed column, basically, the uh, observed vector. Okay, so I, I like this. The least squares principle provides a way of choosing the coefficients effectively by minimizing the sum of square errors. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is uh, explained clearly what training means. Even in more complicated, more, complicated uh, models. Mm -hmm. In general, when you're training a model, what you're doing is establishing a, a cost function and try to minimize that cost function or maximize it, mm -hmm. depending on where, where you want. For example, RMSE, okay? That is used for time series. The RMSE is the cost function, okay? Uh -huh. So you're trying to minimize that you know, to the to the to the most minimum level, with our fitting, of course, but trying to get the minimum because that means that there's going to be a good fit with the observed values. In the yeah. case of the linear regression models, the cost function is that the sum of the square, exactly. error. and exactly. you want to minimize it because that's going to give you the best fit. Exactly. Okay, the best line or the best plane in multiple uh, regression, etc. Okay, so but that's what you're doing in machine yeah. learning. You are getting a cost function, you know, establishing a cost function. Okay, I'm going to minimize or maximize, okay? Usually it's minimize. So I'm going to minimize the minimum cost function because that guarantees that that model is the optimum. Yeah. So the minimum difference, the, the, so the, the, the best coefficient that I, I, could, I could possibly find that will be able to release the minimum difference within the observed values and my values. Yeah, pre pre predicted values, yes. In this case, it's a line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so th this is what I wanted to basically say, just and uh, then finally um, uh, add uh, that one I, um, uh, to summarize how well mm -hmm. a linear regression model fits the data. Um, I use this R square or the adjusted R square because there's more to say. Uh, sometimes the adjusted R square right. is the same. The adjusted R square is the best measure yeah. because the R square has a weakness. Exactly. And it's that when you add components, predictors to that model, your R square is going to stay the same or go up. Okay, exactly. so sometimes it it kind of, you know, gives you the illusion that the model is getting better, but it's not, okay? That's why you, we, add, we do the adjusted R square to penalize when you add a predictor that is really not helping, okay? You know, the gains is, is minimal. So, when you add that to the adjust R square, sometimes it goes down. Okay, yeah. so you're penalizing for adding, you know, uh, predictors. And basically, this uh, R square, the adjusted R square is an adjustment. 
of this. Right. It's an adjustment on the number of predictors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the adjusted square is going to have a limit in terms of the predictors that you're going to add. You know, there's going to be an optimum there. And that's what you want. Okay. okay. You want the predictors that you know give you the most, you know, bang for your buck. And, and what's happen when you calculate or oh, when your model, because then when you do the summary, it releases the value for the square. Uh, what your model does to release this value is calculating the square value of the difference. This is the uh, your hat, which is mm -hmm. this this bit here. You, these are the observed values, and this is your function. So pro, produced by the model. So this is your y hat. So the the what what your model do basically and this is the average value of the your mean, observed yeah. of your observed values uh so and it, it is basically the square of the correlation between the observed values and the predicted values and it ranges between zero and one mm -hmm. so close is to one better is your model uh, and this is all I wanted to uh, say again, repeat again, because sometimes uh, when you do more complicated things, um, those are the building blocks mm -hmm. that leads you there to understand the others. Yep. Uh, and so are very important. And, uh, and this is finally the residual standard error which is the measure of how well the model has fitted the data. Mm -hmm. So this is your, the error. This, this things here, which makes the difference. Okay, so the difference between the observed values and what you done, what your model done. Uh, and the residual standard error is based on the number of predictors. This is a, an adjustment. This is a, the sort of adjustment that the R squared, the adjusted R squared, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yeah. And so um, th this is uh, basically all I wanted to to revisit again. Uh, nothing mm -hmm. else. Good. Then, yeah, all this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're ready for chapter eight, right? Exponential smoothing. <laughs> okay. okay, so have a great uh, weekend, Federica, and I'll see you, you next Friday. <laughs> Bye. Okay, take care.